Oh, come on, people. Come on now. Let's look alive. You know who it is and you know what it is, baby. This is J-Rock, and we are about to explore and explain and dive into the 90s, 80s thriller horror movie starring Jack Nicholson, The Shining. Let's dive deep into this now. If you smile. What J-Rock is cooking. Finally, J-Rock has come back to you too. Well, what is happening in, in, in with the millions? <laughs> of J-Rock's fans from all over the world, J-Rock is here. And you're here with J-Rock, and J-Rock appreciates that. We're about to dive into The Shining. You remember... 1980s, for those of you who are alive then, the movie's The Shining with Jack Nicholson in an isolated area in the hotel. This movie creeped me out when I was younger. But let's dive into some of the back, behind the scenes backdrops of the movie and let's get into what actually took place. Let's explain to this. I found this on a channel called uh, what's the name of it again? Hang on. Found Flicks. Yeah, Found Flicks. And this gentleman does an incredible, an electrifying job of breaking down movies, stories, characters, etc. So I will put the link to his channel in the description box so y'all can go to his channel and tell him, J-Rock, the YouTube people's champ, send him, baby. Or sent you, rather. You know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, let's check this out. It's a long video, so... Rock with me, stay with me, let's do this. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, with the new sequel, Doctor Sleep, I thought it would be the perfect time to revisit the original classic Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, where Jack Torrance becomes the winter caretaker at the Overlook Hotel. Terror starts ratcheting up as Jack uncovers the hotel's dark secrets and begins to mentally unravel into a homicidal maniac. The Shining is one of the most iconic and beloved horror films of all time. There's no question about that. Stanley Kubrick ain't your ordinary director. He's one of the all-time greats. So it's no surprise his version of Stephen King's book is wholly his own vision, busting at the scenes with iconic imagery and moments, all creating a very distinct kind of atmosphere and tone that sets it on its own high tier in the genre. One person who is definitely not a fan of Kubrick's quite different take on the book is the author himself. King has been quite outspoken over the years about how much he dislikes Kubrick's film because it changed so much from his novel. Most importantly, Jack's character. He's portrayed as more sympathetic in the novel, while Jack Nicholson since Jack is pretty much unhinged from the get-go, only getting more insane as time goes on. And yeah, that's the kind of thing you'd expect from Nicholson. He's good at going nuts, that's for sure. So while I do that's understand true. King's perspective, Nicholson's Joker. performance here is one of the most absolutely thrilling of all time to watch. You can even do like an entire acting class just based on Nicholson's facial expressions here. There's some seriously memorable stuff going on. And with a filmmaker like Kubrick, inevitably people are going to be analyzing every single piece of the movie trying to find hidden meanings. And this one has been analyzed every which way imaginable, even to the extent of an entire documentary covering several different whacked out theories cobbled together from things in the movie. Sure, the number 42 plus a German typewriter, that means the movie's really about the Holocaust. Uh, okay, kind of reaching there. For this video, we won't be going quite that far into tinfoil hat territory, but we'll be dipping our toes into some of those hidden meanings I think actually are there, while also answering the movie's biggest questions. Stuff like, what's the deal with the teddy bear guy? Just who is Tony? The reason behind the hotel's evil, along with, of course, explaining the unforgettable ending and what it means. Dread and fear is instantly created from the very opening, with some creepy-ass music and haunting Sith, with a healthy dose of weird, ghostly vocals soundtracking sick helicopter shots flying over the mountains. Now, this is way before drones, remember? Their former school teacher, Jack Torrance, first pays a visit to the Overlook Hotel in Colorado in the hope of landing the winter caretaker gig. He meets Ullman, who lays out the basic responsibilities, but also warns that essentially 
essentially being trapped out here for several months could create a tremendous sense of isolation. But Jack is confident that won't be a problem. He's looking for some peace and quiet to work on a book. And he's absolutely positive his wife and son will love living in the middle of nowhere for months too. This all seeming like a huge lie, already showing us just how desperate he is. He's willing to say anything to get the job without even taking his family's feelings into consideration. Jack above all else, which becomes even more clear when Ullman informs him of an alarming incident from the hotel's history. Back in 1970, the winter caretaker, a man named Charles Grady, went nuts and chopped up his wife and two daughters with an axe, chalking it up as your classic case of cabin fever. And again, Jack plays it cool, even suggesting that his wife would find the story amusing, as she's a fan of horror films. Well, if you okay. say so, Jackie boy, yeah. and don't worry, you're definitely not going to go nuts and try to do the exact same thing he did that is definitely, definitely not going to happen. No. Course Meanwhile, Jack's course son Danny why, and why, wife why Wendy it, are right? discussing the job over breakfast, as well as her casually smoking a cigarette around her child. Ah, the good old days. Asking if he's excited about the hotel, he's not so sure. Well, what about Tony, she asks. And Danny starts wagging his finger, speaking in a weird, croaky voice. And turns out Tony ain't excited to go there either. Tony is referred to as his imaginary friend, which is sort of accurate, but Tony is actually a part of Danny, related to his ability to shine. Here, Tony acts as kind of a guide to Danny's shining powers, allowing him to see events in the past, present, and future. This is first glimpse when Tony says that Jack already got the job and will be calling soon, which happens exactly as predicted, followed by another more frightening image. When asking again about the hotel and why he's afraid to go there, Danny's shown a vision of blood Blood pouring out of a set of elevators, flooding the floor in a gruesome tidal wave. This episode causes him to black out and not remember what happened. And when a concerned Wendy calls a doctor, she asks when he started speaking with Tony, remembering it was all the way back in nursery school. He didn't adjust well to school, and after an accident, his parents pulled him from class, the accident being one of grave importance to the family. One night, a drunken and angry Jack came home, finding papers of his strewn all over the floor, caused by Danny. When he went to go yank the boy away, it was with a enough force that it dislocated his shoulder. Well, that's not a good sign of Jack's character already, based on that, and his already established selfish nature, even if she insists that it was only an accident. Whatever you gotta tell yourself, sweetheart, he did at least vow to never drink again, and has been on the level ever since. So, you know, that's something. Arriving at the hotel, the family are given a tour of the grounds, and Wendy is quite impressed with its size and beauty. Ullman delves into the location's history, including quite importantly that it was built on top of an Indian burial ground. The building crew even having to fight off Indian yeah, attackers out, during construction. We uh -oh, well, year. we know even from just Stephen King stories alone that it is bad mojo to build on top of a graveyard. Yeah. And the many restless spirits could be responsible for the hotel's evil, essentially cursed due to its location. Here we come to one of the more popular insane theories that I do actually kind of buy into the movie's relation to white man's overtaking of the Indian. We have the literal building on the mm. sacred ground of their dead. Also seen throughout the hotel is obvious Indian iconography, a kind of bastardization of what they have callously destroyed in building the hotel, which does sound like how things went back in the old West days with a white man wiping out the Native Americans. In addition to Jack specifically using the phrase later of white man's burden, this all seems like one of those bigger themes that Kubrick actually was going for. While his parents are getting the grand tour, Danny is left alone alone with a dartboard, oddly encountering a pair of girls in matching dresses. These are the Grady twins who were actually slain by their father Charles. But they say nothing and leave, almost letting Danny know that the games have only just begun. Mm -hmm. They meet Dick Halloran, a gentleman and the hotel chef who shows off a white snack okay. pantry and walk-in freezer, and makes fast friends with Danny, who he calls Doc, a nickname that his parents use, but how would he know that? Because just like Danny, he has the shining as well, explaining over a bowl of ice cream that he and his grandmother used to have entire conversations without opening their mouths, and learned over time that there were others out there with the same abilities. Danny mentions Tony, but he doesn't want him to talk about anything. Dick then asks if he's shown him anything about the Overlook. He doesn't answer, but we know the blood of Ader is from the hotel, a warning, if you will. Dick feels that just like some people have a shining, some places do as well, such as the Overlook, saying that when something happens, a trace of it is left behind, but only those with the shine can see these traces, believing a lot of things have happened in the hotel over the years and not all of them were good. And perhaps from reading Dick's thoughts, Danny asks about room 237, thinking that there's something bad in there that he's afraid of. 
But Dick insists he's not afraid, while also demanding that Danny never enter the room. Well, that seems suspicious, as though he's already aware of something bad in there. A month later, the family appears to have fallen into a comfortable routine at the hotel. The ever-caring and sweet Wendy bringing a still snoozing Jack some breakfast. She asks to go on a walk, but he says he's gotta do some writing first. Our first sign of his becoming separated from his family and turning obsessed with working, even though he admits he has no good ideas. This seems to be another major actual problem for Jack, that he's just not a very good writer, and that's where a lot of his problems come from as well. As the days pass, we see his behavior already becoming more aggressive and closed off. While furiously typing away at the typewriter, Wendy cheerily comes in asking how it's going. He grumbles that he wants to finish his work and goes off on her about how every time she comes in, his concentration is broken, establishing a new yeah. rule. If he's in the room, that means he's working, so don't come in. Jeez, what a total ass. Soon there's a massive snowstorm that covers the grounds. Seeing Wendy and Danny happily frolicking outside, well, Jack's definitely got something else going on. Staring blankly out the window and looking totally deranged. Man, I love that face. Might be my favorite one. Turns out the storm took down the phone line, and when using an emergency radio, she finds out it's the worst storm they've had in years, and the lines usually stay down until spring. Gee, sure is remote out here. At least they still have the emergency radio in case something bad happens. Elsewhere, Danny is rolling around the hotel on his big wheel. The Grady twins are back, and this time they've got something to say. Telling him hello. Also seeing flashes of their hacked up bodies. Asking Danny to come play with them forever and ever and ever. He covers his face in horror, and peeking through a moment later, they're gone. He asks Tony for help, who reminds him of what Dick said. They're just traces, like pictures in a book. They aren't real and can't actually hurt him. Still pretty terrifying though. Jack continues to lose his grip mentally, found by Danny sitting on the edge of the bed in a daze. He asks him over, and even though he seems genuine, everything he says is actually somehow disturbing and off. He maintains that he loves the hotel, and echoing the twins says he wants to stay forever and ever. Danny can sense something off, asking if he would ever hurt him or his mother. Jack cops a major frowny face, saying he loves him more than anything else and would never hurt him, accompanied by a big old insane grin. See, everything's fine, Danny, nothing to worry about. Good lord, this dude is going nuts. What? One day while playing with some cars, a tennis ball rolls towards Danny out of nowhere. Jack he Nicholson follows it to the usually locked room 237, this time this finding the door wide open thinking it must be his mom in there. The curiosity takes him through the forbidden door. Though we don't actually see what happens. Back at his desk, Jack is going ballistic, hurt by Wendy screaming, finding him in the throes of a nightmare. Trying to bring him back, he topples out of the chair, and looking genuinely frightened, reveals he dreamt of killing her and Danny in the same exact manner as Charles Grady. He is coming to realize that he is losing his mind. Yeah, you think oh, you so, know. bud? Woo wait. Danny enters the scene and Wendy know. notices marks on his neck, assuming that it was Jack responsible having harmed the boy again. But he's still way too disturbed to defend himself or even really say anything in response as she flees with her boy. A still upset Jack rages and yells at no one, coming to the gold room and takes a seat at the empty bar. And we can see Jack longing for even a sweet sip of lady liquor. His luck is about to change, a bartender magically appearing in the bar now completely stopped. Strangely, Jack already knows the man's name is Lloyd who he says he always liked better than the others, implying that they have met before. Lloyd here, and indeed all of the spirits seen, are manifestations of the evil at the hotel, and are obviously setting Jack up to inevitably go bonkers and kill his family. When asking how things are going, he admits things could be better, but he also maintains that he would never hurt Danny. His wife, on the other hand, he reveals he is less of a fan of, calling her a bitch for never letting him forget what he did. Wow, what a romantic, huh? His venting session is interrupted by a frantic Wendy, who has new concerns in the hotel, that of a supposed woman in room 237, who is the one who actually hurt Danny. Looks like some of these spirits, at least, are more than just traces and can actually cause physical harm. The book makes the connection more obvious, but the spirits are becoming more dangerous because of Danny's presence and powers, kind of feeding on them to grow stronger. Though they can also do more than harm as Jack goes to investigate the room, which appears completely normal until entering the bathroom. And there actually is somebody in the tub, a shapely young woman and exits and alluringly approaches Jack, which she seems to approve of in another hilariously demented looking smirk. She plants a big kiss on him, and her figure changes to a rotted older woman who cackles and chases him in disbelief. Yeah, out that, that the part was uh, disturbing. Is, to say but the she least. was once Very a patron disturbing. of the hotel, Miss Massey. She came to have an affair with a younger man, only for him to steal her ride and abandon her. The heartbreak was enough for her to take her own life in the tub.
tub. This moment, at least to me, also has a more significant thematic relevance as well. It's almost as though this moment is the hotel's evil enticing Jack into the dark side. She first appears in her more attractive state, which he falls for immediately, then reverting to her true appearance, much more unappealing and well get dead rotting flesh. Evil tempts in many ways, but the outcome is always unfavorable. He was duped by a shiny package, and in some ways it seems that choosing to go for that ghostly kiss robs Jack of what little is left of his humanity. When returning to Wendy, he chooses to tell her he didn't see anything in the room and thinks that it must have been Danny who actually harmed himself. All the strangeness is enough for Wendy to want to leave, but Jack gets extremely heated. He claims she's fucked up his life so far and won't let her do it anymore. And his bizarre true feelings about Wendy are really starting to come to the surface. She's been extremely nice to him the entire time and supportive and everything. What does he do? He acts like a big jerk face. Seeking solace from Lady Liquor, Jack returns to his old water Hole, this time finding a huge party in full swing. And based on the outfits, they must be from the aforementioned 1920s heyday of the hotel. He bumps into a waiter, who then guides him in the bathroom to clean the mess up. Jack asks the man's name, telling him Delbert Grady. He's confused, asking about murdering his family, but Delbert doesn't recall. That's because he's thinking of Charles Grady, not Delbert, meaning there are two completely different Grady's that have fallen victim to the hotel. Jack yeah. still doesn't understand this key difference, insisting that he was the former caretaker. But Delbert cracks him that Jack is the caretaker and that he always has been, which only confuses him further. As we know, all these spirits are created by the hotel and thus they are acting in its benefit. Delbert then begins to make clear their plan to murder his family. He mentions that Danny has a special talent and is bringing Halloran into his aid, using his talents against Jack's will, offering that his son might need a good talking to, perhaps a bit more. Yeah, like an axe to the face or something. You know, proper discipline. Delbert yeah, right. then begins to reference Charles's murderous actions, or perhaps he also had two daughters just as he did, and says that one of his daughters tried to set fire to the hotel, which luckily he corrected. This is interesting because it sounds like one of his girls caught on to the fact that the hotel was bad, and thusly would have had the shine as well. Seemingly in reaction to the mounting danger, Danny is taken over by Tony, chanting red rum over and over, telling his mother Danny's gone away. Her husband isn't faring much better, discovering his latest output. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy endlessly typed on stacks of papers. He appears and attempts to kill her, trying to convince her to hand over the bat, which he does, in a way, uh. bashing him in the head with it, which knocks him out cold, tumbling down the stairs, allowing her to lock him up in the cold storage freezer for the time being. But before Wendy leaves, Jack has one last surprise for her, he says. Her discovering that the radio and the snowcat have been damaged, meaning they have no means of contact with anyone or escape, especially with a never-ending relentless storm outside. First things first, though, he's got to get out of the freezer. Luckily, a familiar voice pays him a visit on the other side of the door. Delbert, who expresses disappointment in him so far, wondering along with the other hotel spirits if he has what it takes to do what they asked and kill his family. Mm. He gets pissed, especially that Wendy got the better of him and vows to do what must be done to be set free. This moment is the only purely supernatural moment in the entire film. Again, how's a ghost gonna let you out of a cold storage freezer? Could have been Danny though, I guess. The boy has another total freak out, which actually seems more like a warning to the sleeping Wendy. Still chanting red rum, he grabs a big old knife, writing it in and lipstick on the door as seen in an earlier vision. He begins to scream, which wakes her up, seeing in the reflection that it spells murder, just as Jack is getting to work on the door with an ax. Mm. See, seems like Tony was actually trying to help her, warning yeah. her right before Jack got there and making sure she was armed too. Thanks, Tone. More help is on the way from the kindly and shining uh, attuned chef, guy. Mr. Halloran, who grew increasingly concerned over the family's well-being, especially after Danny guy. reaches out to him for help with his shine, flying all the way from Florida and renting his own snowcat just to get to the hotel. But I'll be damned if he doesn't have the worst luck of all time. Barely making it inside, he calls out to the empty halls, which draws Jack away from Wendy and surprises Halloran with a fatal axe blow. Dang, no. after all that. Too bad you don't have Spidey sense or something. That, that would have come in handy. The hotel's evil now at full power. More strange things await Wendy as she flails around, like a dude in a teddy bear costume giving someone a blowjob. <laughs> all right, of course. This is almost a non sequitur in the movie version. Wow. Just a bizarre, that even unexplained it? moment. But this is another guest who got into this kind of mischief who was fleshed out more in the book, as she encounters more in the Hotel of Horrors, like a split-head Delbert cheering and declaring it a great party, then finding the entire main room now decrepit and covered in cobwebs, its occupants now all 
all elegantly dressed skeletons. And of course, our big finale, the infamous Blood Evader. Yeah, there it is. Oh yeah, that's gonna be a pain to clean up. Outside, Danny flees into the hedge maze and has one of the most intense chase scenes in movie history, trying to evade his deranged father in the snowy labyrinth. He finally makes it back to the entrance just as Wendy is coming outside, hopping into Dick's snowcat. Thanks, buddy. And they flee into the night. Jack is left behind, yowling for them and growing weaker. With no means of escape, he freezes to death in the bitter cold all alone. Seen sometime later, frozen into a jacksicle. Well, guess that's what you get for being a selfish jerk that's susceptible to being consumed by evil. We then return inside the hotel. Amongst the wall of photographs, one party is singled out. A big group of revelers with what looks like Jack front and center, a beaming smile on his face. Strangest of all is the photograph's date, 1921. But that's because the man in the photo isn't actually Jack but a former incarnation of him, and our Jack is a reincarnation of that man. The biggest clue to this being the case is the Delbert and Charles Grady thing, two different people from the same family that were taken by the hotel. It appears the same goes for Jack's family line, doomed with each successive generation to live the same fate just as Delbert tells him. He's the caretaker and always has been. Additionally, when Jack is beginning to lose it, he does admit that he feels like he has been here before and could tell what was around every hallway. Along with knowing who Lloyd the bartender was by name and everything as though they had a pre-existing relationship in another life. It all kind of comes into focus what's going on here. And again, if Grady's daughter did have the shine, this could be the specific reason why. The hotel is seeking out those more gifted people out there, and as it has its own shine, can in a sense lure them here. Now the outcome of the film is quite a bit different than the novel, which seems to be another reason King isn't a fan of the adaptation. Rather than a lengthy heads chase, Danny enters the maze and the topiary animals come to life. They had actually intended to use this idea in the movie, but couldn't figure out the logistics of bringing that effect to reality. So it was adjusted to the chase, which still works well as Jack is 100% a villain by that point with no going back, just a terrifying chase through the snow. That was another issue that King had, that this Jack was kind of a jerk the whole time, only taken to the deadly degree by the hotel, as the novel's ending gives a hint of redemption for the character. One of his duties was to maintain the boilers, and guess what? He doesn't do it, creating a dangerous amount of pressure over time. He gets Danny and Wendy out to safety and attempts to go down to fix the problem, but it's too late. The boiler explodes, taking him and the entire overlook in the explosion, rather than leaving the hotel standing as it is in the movie. The movie abruptly ends with Danny and Wendy's escape, but in the novel, in addition to Halloran also surviving, we learn the specifics of just who Tony is. As I said earlier, he is a part of Danny, and he actually is an older Danny helping his younger self from 10 years in the future. Hey. The shine, as we know, can show events from the past about and this. future, and Danny's older self is helping his younger version go through what must have been the most difficult experience of his life and act as a guide to help him through the terror and learn how to use his powers. So Tony definitely was an ally to Danny and Wendy. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this ending explained on The Shining. While I'm sure there are tons of other hidden things I'm missing, we'll never really know for sure what any of it means as Kubrick is long gone, and he's the only one that could answer about all this stuff. But there is a lot of interesting little details that I didn't even mention before, like the very weird layout of the hotel, which seems designed specifically to disorient you, such as the magical window right in the middle of the hotel. Just doesn't make sense. Or why does the typewriter change color? Or where the heck did that chair go in that one scene? Hmm. A continuity error? I kind of doubt it, because of just how meticulous Kubrick was. There's almost an endless amount of these details and moments to delve into, which just shows us how much of a visionary director he was, creating the entire world from scratch and manipulating every single piece of it to craft the world of his movies. Pretty impressive stuff. I guess that's why he's considered a pretty good director. Yeah. Some people like yeah. it. Now Stephen King though. What do you guys think of The Shining and its ending? Do you have any wacky theories of your own about the movie's real meaning? All right. Let me know your thoughts in the comment below. Man, that was a good explanation of the movie. A lot of the stuff I have forgotten about, uh, like the end where the older Danny was helping his younger self. I have forgotten all about that. Uh, forgot the guy's name who was the black guy who came to help and got killed like right as soon as he came in that poor guy he was just trying to help but yeah the, uh jack nicholson was just just surgical in this movie with with his acting as far as the facial expressions the, the tone of his voice the i mean the dude was just a master in this movie uh, and he did a great job i often wondered if i was ever given the opportunity to live or even stay in a big hotel, maybe for a month or so if I would do it. Don't know. Depends on where it is. 
uh, by myself, probably not. I'd like to have some folks in there with me. Uh, but anyway, uh, that that movie really disturbed me, especially the part where the lady gets out the tub. You know, she's young, and then she start, starts to deteriorate into this older, decrepit, and her skin starts to, ah, uh, that, that, that part just really disturbed me, very much so. Uh, I'm interested in finding out how this movie affected you guys, so post your comments down below and let me know what you thought of this movie. Uh, if you've seen it, what you remember most about it, what you like, what you didn't dislike, or what you didn't like, rather. Uh, post that down below and let me know. Also, the link to my Facebook fan page is down below. If you got a video that you like, you want me to check it out and react to it, post it there. And if I select your video, I'll give you a shout out on the People's Channel. All right? Uh, once I get to uh, 100 subscribers, I'll start doing a, a giveaway of that. More to come on it uh, as I get closer to that. So make sure you're subscribing and comment on my videos on the regular so you can be a part of the drawing. Also, hit that bell so that you can be notified that it is time to be electrified. Thank you for joining J-Rock. Until we meet again. If you smell la, 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 what J-Rock is.